Hi, I'm Danny, and I don't know why I keep telling you that at the start of my videos, because I'm pretty sure you know that already. This is the last video in the microeconomic range, woohoo! And actually the last Economics A2 video I'm going to be making, because I've already done all the macro ones, so yay for that. It's quite a short video, only nine slides long, so let's go. Pretty sure I always say let's go, and then I always end with have a lovely day. Like, I'm so predictable, it's dreadful. Here are some examples of market failure. Market failure is basically when the free market fails to achieve efficient allocation of resources. So externalities, we've got negative externalities and positive externalities. Negative externalities, goods tend to be underpriced, doesn't take into account the external costs of production or consumption. Positive externalities tend to be overpriced, because it doesn't take into account the external benefits. Next one is merit or demerit goods. Merit goods are underproduced and demerit goods are overproduced because people don't realise the benefits or costs, again, of consumption or um, production. Public goods aren't produced on the competitive market because they're not profitable. This is because they are non-rival and non-excludable. If you want to know more about public goods, you can watch Economics Unit 1 video on market failure. It'll be all about that in there. Imperfect information helps to contribute to the overconsumption or underconsumption of merit or demerit goods because people aren't fully aware of the benefits or costs of what they're consuming. So education tends to be underconsumed because people don't realise how important it is and cigarettes tend to be overconsumed because people aren't fully aware of the health risks. Or in fact they probably are, but they they think it's not going to be them. Because I don't think you can miss the this will kill you on cigarette packets these days. Um, monopolies is the next one, they tend to lead to overpriced goods, obviously you can draw some of the diagrams we did earlier on because they're going to be producing where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, so they're not going to be at the base of their average total cost curve, not going to be productively, allocatively efficient and stuff like that. Immobility of factors of production leads to wastage, obviously frictional unemployment is a big example of that one, and equity issues, poverty and inequality are examples of market failure. Basically, anything that leads to productive inefficiency, which is when firms aren't producing at the base of their ATC, or allocative inefficiency, when the resources aren't being used to produce the goods or services wanted by consumers, that's examples of market failure. It's not the ideal situation. It's not maximising welfare. We have a slide now on government intervention, how they can do it, and how it can go horribly wrong. At the bottom there, we see the Prime Minister, or a terrible drawing of the Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, who was voted the worst prime minister of the 20th century or something like that. He's literally at the bottom of all the lists, it's a joke. Margaret Thatcher's like fourth in some of them. Horrific. Right, government intervention. Basically that's when the government tries to intervene to correct market failure. They do something to try to correct it. So you could have legislation or regulation. That tends to increase sort of competitiveness in the market, make it uh, better for firms to compete, also make sure that consumer welfare is maximised so you don't have any dodgy products coming on the market. State provision is the next one, so that's of goods and services, particularly merit goods, because otherwise they'd be unconsumed, like education and healthcare, definitely two big ones that they provide, and they also provide any public goods, even though I don't think pure public goods really exist at all. Maybe a lighthouse. Fiscal policy is the next one, so anything like indirect taxes, subsidies, even direct tab taxes to try to redistribute income more fairly. So any fiscal intervention is government intervention because I think something's wrong there. And improving the quality and availability of information available to try to swing the way people spend their money, so move it away from demerit goods onto merit goods. Government failure now on the left. Sometimes government intervention doesn't improve allocation, and if you're a free market economist, you'll believe that government failure is inevitable. I don't think it's inevitable, it just happens a lot. So, why might this happen? Political self-interest? Parties are like, well, I'm going to try to get all these votes, so I'm going to do this and this and this. And uh, they do lots of things that aren't actually beneficial for the economy as a whole, they're only beneficial in the short term. That's a policy in myopia as well, actually. It's when you have a short-term solution for a long-term problem, and that's particularly uh, used by uh, parties before elections and then are up to elections. They tend to try to manoeuvre these massive booms, and then you tend to have a slight downturn after elections. Imperfect information is another one they can uh, try to do something, but they obviously haven't got all the information they need to make the right decision. So they try to correct, they might try to correct the issue of imperfect information using imperfect information, which just makes everything go terribly wrong. And we're going to look at that one, well, we're not really going to look at that one, but we're going to sort of try to look at that one in cost benefit analysis, which is on the last slide. The law of unintended consequences is next. This is a great one to quote, literally always quote it, because, I mean, it's not worth that much because they know you're going to quote it, but just stick it down there. Just say, they could do this, but then this could happen, and this could happen, and this could happen, like black markets could happen, or disincentives, anything that they don't expect to happen. 
and regulatory capture, which is basically when those that are setting the regulations for firms are influenced by large firms. Obviously, that's unfair on small firms and so on and so forth. Actually, slightly out of breath from recording that, which may indicate that I need to exercise more. I've been juggling a lot at the moment. It's actually a really good exercise. You can feel, well, you can't feel, but I can feel for my arm muscles are strengthening. So that's good, I guess. Uh, environmental market failure. So this is basically any th market failure that will have a negative impact on the environment, surprisingly. Uh, negative externalities are basically negative spillover effects to third parties that aren't involved in the production or consumption. Here we have our diagram there. Uh, basically shows that social costs are greater than private costs. Obviously profit maximising firms in a competitive market are only going to be taken into account their own costs and not pollution and stuff that might affect the environment. The free market equilibrium for any demerit good is going to be at a price less than the social equilibrium. Which basically means a little allocative inefficiency and we have that little triangle there is welfare loss. For more detail on this and for a diagram of positive externalities and stuff like that, go and re-watch the market failure video uh, in Unit 1, Economics Unit 1. Distributional effects basically happen because environmental externalities don't always affect those who create them. So on the one hand, if you're smoking, you're probably affecting yourself the most lung cancer, although it can affect people like passive smoking. But if you've got a big factory producing lots of pollution, it can often affect people like in countries far, far away. So it might lead to them having flooding or drought or something terrible. So global warming that we produce is negatively affecting them more than us. So I think the proposed solution for that is to impose tax on the output of industrialised nations and then use the revenue they get from this tax to try to compensate citizens in other countries for anything like they've lost or try to make their lives better or try to reduce the impact. It's all a bit dodgy if you ask me. Environmental tax is basically a tax based on a good or service that has a negative impact on the environment. Uh, lots of examples of this like air passenger duty, congestion charges, fuel duty, anything like that. Uh, I think there's quite a high excise duty on cigarettes, but that might be more to do with the healthcare side rather than the sort of damage it does to the environment, but it probably helps with both. If you're putting an environmental tax on, if you want it to be sort of fully effective, do the full job, you're going to want it to be the vertical height between the marginal social cost bar and the marginal personal cost bar. Um, I think I might have done that at uh, Unit 1. I said I don't think I did, but I could have done potentially. <laughs> um... Basically, it tries to move the production levels towards the social optimum and use the revenue that it makes to fund environmental cleanup. All very good and good, but then we look here and there's lots of issues with environmental taxation. Very hard to put an accurate monetary value on the environment. I mean, your sort of judgment on how much a whale is worth might be very different to mine. Like, I love animals, but I think there are more important things than whales. Although whales are really cute, so maybe not. I don't know. Hopefully there's some more important things than whales. Next one is you're unsure of reactions. So you, you don't know how firms are going to react to changing demand and supply if you put a tax on something. Um, and it's very difficult to sort of achieve your target level. You can often overshoot it or undershoot it, which can sort of distort economic signals in the market and stuff like that. Inelastic demand will raise revenue, so it's great you can clear up the environment, but it's not going to reduce output that much because the firm will put the tax straight onto the consumer because they know they're going to continue to demand the product. So cigarettes is a big one there. Any increase in tax goes straight to the consumer because demand is so inelastic. If you impose a tax on demerit goods, again cigarettes, that could be regressive because consumption might be more for lower income than higher income. Although I think there's only one, I think it might be cigarettes, there's only one that is actually that way distributed. There was a graph and there's only, you have all these sort of um, demerit goods and you'd think that the proportion spent on it by the poorer people would be higher, but it's actually considerably lower than the proportion spent by the higher people, um, higher, higher income people. And the last one is international competitiveness. Obviously if you're putting a tax on and Russia isn't, I don't know why I said Russia, they might be too, but let's say you are and Russia isn't, your goods are going to become less competitive compared to theirs because yours are going to be more expensive because costs of production are going to have increased. I think everyone's just got Russia on their minds after Eurovision Song Contest. I really love Eurovision Song Contest, it's great. I'm going to be on it one day. Well, I'm not, but I could potentially be if everyone else died. So how else could we tackle environmental market failure? Well, we could do pollution regulation so the government could set a pollution quota and then fine any firms that over sort of pollute this. But this is very expensive. It's hard to monitor pollution because it sort of goes off into the atmosphere and stuff like that. If you're doing it on a sort of more international level, pollution permits tend to do a good job there. Extending property rights, uh, this is basically to do with the tragedy of the commons. So basically if no one owns, I say basically loads, but if no one owns the land then no one has the incentive to protect it. A big example of this is going to be the fishing industry because no one owns the fish no one has an incentive not to fish. 
So there's lots of things the government could do there. They could set up um, any sort of uh, regulation, put people in charge of land, tell people they've got responsibility or increase taxes and stuff like that. And uh, if you sort of tax people for damaging the environment, they feel more sort of responsible to protect it, or they don't feel responsible to protect it, but they have an incentive to protect it because they want to keep their cost of production low to remain competitive. At the bottom there we have the Kaito Protocol. It's got loads of O's in it. One, two, three, four O's. Not going to forget that one. And the Kaito Protocol was basically an agreement made at a global summit meeting to cut world carbon emissions. So if you want to slide that into an essay, it might look cool. Might not. Might just look really nerdy, but who cares? CBA for CBA. <laughs> I always think that every time. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis is basically an investment appraisal technique which takes into account all private and external costs and benefits of an economic decision used by governments in sort of evaluating investment projects. I was with someone recently, they kept saying projects, and I don't know where they say projects, but where I'm from we all say projects. But if anyone knows where that sort of dialect is, then let me know. So how does cost-benefit analysis take place? Well, first, someone has to identify all the relevant costs and benefits arising out of a project. Obviously, this is quite difficult to do because you're never quite sure of unintended consequences and stuff like that. But you try your best to identify all the relevant costs and benefits. And then you divide them into private and external costs and benefits. And you place a monetary value on the costs and benefits. And this is very difficult. I think on the next slide we're going to look at issues with CBA. And one of the big ones is that it is very, very hard to place a value on things. It's like the whales earlier. It's almost impossible to place a value on that sort of thing. Uh, these prices, these sort of values we place on these costs and benefits are called shadow prices. Then we have to use statistical forecasting techniques to estimate the long-term costs and benefits. And this is a lot harder because it's very hard for people to see into the future and take an estimate of how much things are going to impact future generations and stuff like that. But that is definitely something they have to do. Then you'll compare the social costs and social benefits. And if social benefits are greater than social costs, then the project will go ahead. And if not, then government probably will decide against it. Or they might think, oh, it's going to look good for us, so we're going to do it anyway. This is the last slide. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. Hooray! That's my singing for Eurovision. I'm totally prepped. Uh, there we have a tree hugger because I thought we can't have a last slide without a jolly image on. Except then my computer started messing about, which is why I was wearing a hat. He wasn't going to be wearing a hat originally. Not that that makes a massive difference, but there we have Adiba hugging a tree. Uh, cost benefit analysis limitations. The first one is distributional impacts. Cost benefit analysis tends to look more about sort of the local impacts. It's not going to consider what's going to happen in Africa if we decide to build a new factory. It's going to be looking much more locally, which obviously isn't great if you live in Africa. Project objections. You might have this uh, cost benefit analysis that says, look, we really should go ahead with this, but say you're the you're deciding to build a new house or a new village, a new town, a new city, and it's in a field next to one's house, you're going to have a lot of objections to that, so you might not be able to go ahead with the project due to sort of objections from pressure groups, stuff like that, and especially like the environmental pressure groups, they can be really strong, scary, they scare me. So the animals, I'm really scared of cows. Uh, valuation difficulties. And very difficult to place a value on environment, human life, that sort of thing. It's the whales again. We've already been through this about 50 times. So yeah, that's the cost-benefit analysis limitations. Probably won't come up this year because it came up last year or something, really recently. But now you know cost-benefit analysis if you need it. Ooh, totally exhausted. Like, sort of steamrolled through that and probably put you all to sleep. And you probably can keep up. I can keep up. I'm pretty sure my voice kept going ahead of my brain because I speak too fast. But yeah, that's the last video on microeconomics, so I really hope these videos have helped you, that you've made it through to the end. You might wake up now and realise you've slept through the last 10 videos, basically the whole lot, wouldn't blame you. Uh, best of luck with the exam, massive thanks to my economics teacher, Mr J, who has given me loads of help this year, and has definitely um, taught me a lot about economics, taught me a lot of content, he's really interested in economic stuff, so we know all the latest economic facts as soon as they come out. Yeah. So go enjoy yourself, start juggling, it's really good fun, and best of luck with the exam. Bye!